thanks everyone for joining us today. We'll we'll give people a minute or two to uh, collect in uh, into the session today, and uh, we'll get started. Uh, we appreciate everyone's time. All right, we'll go ahead and kick this off. We've got a, 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 a pretty busy panel here. We're going to try and hit a number of topics uh, that I think are are key to this, uh, you know, this issue around ransomware. So, uh, welcome again. My name is Rudolf Araujo. Uh, I'm the VP of Marketing here at Awake Security, and I wanted to thank you for uh, for joining us today on uh, for our topic: CISO perspectives, preventing ransomware while preparing for the worst. Uh, Clearly, ransomware is all around us, right? I mean, it's uh, it's evolved tremendously. Uh, it's now a business model. Uh, yes, I'll say that again. It's it's a business model. It's not just a technical uh, piece of malware that we're dealing with. Um, and and you know, unfortunately, today it's it's much more than just recovering your data, right? It's not just about backups and, and things like that. In fact, um, you know, George, Malcolm, and I were just talking that just last week. Uh, uh, you know what's reportedly the first fatality associated with ransomware, right? There was a a, a, a patient that uh, couldn't get into the hospital because the hospital was dealing with ransomware, um, and as she was being moved around, uh, you know, she passed away unfortunately. Uh, so, you know, this is a very real problem, and and as CISOs, you clearly want to prevent this threat uh, from manifesting in your environment, but you also want to think about uh, what happens if it if it does get in. Right? If someone clicks on that wrong link or, or brings in a device that, that, that was infected, uh, how do you react when you get that dreaded ransom note? Uh, so we're lucky today to be joined by two uh, tremendously uh, experienced security leaders. Uh, George Finney uh, is the CISO at Southern Methodist University. Uh, I'm sure you'll see his, his, his mug uh, you know, uh, through, through this, uh, you know, he's a big fan of, of the team. Uh, and uh, and Malcolm Harkins, uh, former CISO at Intel and member of Awake's uh, CISO advisory board. Um, Malcolm and George have not just been around this industry for a long time, but they they understand security at the end of the day operates in the context of the larger business. Right, this is not just a technical problem. Uh, and as active CISOs themselves, they work through many of these practical challenges uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and I'm here to share their perspectives and, and hopefully also learn a thing or two from our audience, which, uh, I, you know, I'll certainly encourage you, uh, you know, use that chat, use that Q&A feature. We want this to be interactive. This is not a, uh, you know, talking heads show uh, today. Um, and, and, you know, in, in, in that way, and we're going to split the session into in kind of two topic areas, right? First, uh, we'll focus on things to consider to do to prevent ransomware in your environment. You know, what has worked, what has not. We will then move into a second part. Uh, that focuses on the worst case scenarios, if you will, right? You do get hit with ransomware. Now now what? Uh, you know, how, how, how should you think about it? How should your executives think about it? Uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and again, your success with dealing with this threat really comes down to preparation, right? And, 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 and both uh, George and, and Malcolm will, will attest to that. So, so again, you know, keep this interactive, keep, keep it coming. But without further ado, uh, let's dive in. Malcolm and George, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, George, maybe I'll start with you, uh, right? Uh, before we dive in, I know you have a book coming out in, 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 in a couple of weeks. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, what, what, what your book's going to focus on? Yeah, so it's, it's, the book is called Well Aware. Um, and, you know, I, I think the reason I wrote it is, you know, I want to, you know, create a bridge between, you know, security functions, CISOs, and other executives. Um, and, you know, the, we, we focus, I think, so often on the negative in cybersecurity, uh, and, and that makes sense. We, you know, we want to prevent bad things. We want to prevent ransomware. We want to prevent the breach. Um, but, you know, focusing on, you know, just the, the negative, you know, leaves us, I, I think, a little vulnerable. And so, you know, I, I've looked at, you know, cybersecurity habits or cybersecurity as a habit. Um, and, you know, I, I think there, there are so many great stories about leadership out there. Um, the book isn't just about, you know, me and, and, and my ideas. I, I actually interviewed folks uh, that, that, I, that I think 
you know, represent the, those cybersecurity habits as, as, as examples that we can uh, follow. Um, so, you know, looking at the, the you know, the, the psychology or neuroscience behind, you know, why we do uh, the, the things that we do, I, I think is incredibly important, you know, when we think about the, the, the people part of, of the cybersecurity equation. Um, so, so well aware comes out on October 20th. Excellent. Uh, thanks, George. And, uh, you know, just for the audience, so we do have, uh, we were lucky to get some signed copies of George's book. So, uh, you know, reach out to your awake uh, uh, representative and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get a, a copy over to you. Um, so, so with that, uh, you know, let's, let's dive in, right? So, so, you know, maybe let's start with the obvious. What, what, what kind of prevention mechanisms have, have worked well for, for you or for your peers that, that, that you know of? Uh, you know, M Malcolm, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, you know, I, I think it, it, it goes into a few different aspects of the prevention side, right? You know, the, the first thing is, is there, um, what, what are the controls that you've got in place that, that prevent, you know, the, the bad guy from getting a foothold from execution of malicious code on the devices? You know, that, that really becomes, I'd say, the primary key control. And, and certainly, you know, my time uh, from Intel and when I transitioned to silence, you know, that, that's part of the reason why you've seen, you know, the silences, the Sentinel ones, the crowd strikes um, of the worlds gain a lot of traction because the efficacy of that control is substantially, substantially better than traditional AV and in the signature based things and, and all that. So, so in, in many cases, that, that being a first key control, but then you, since you can't eliminate risk, right, you have to look at other mechanisms, right, in the detection and response space, because the earlier you can detect something, you can minimize the damage and the sprawl that it might create and, and limit it from, from getting, you know, from one system and the lateral movement to others. Uh, and, and then the other aspect of the ransomware is obviously, you know, your backups and other um, secondary systems and stuff like that. So that way, even if you, you know, do get impacted, you still have some level of, even if it's degraded mode operations, your business or the business processes can still function in some way. So you have to look at it, you know, it grossly in those areas. How do you stop the, the foothold from, from, you know, taking place and, and, and get efficacy at that level? How do you detect it early enough should something occur so that you can again minimize the, the spread and sprawl of it and then should something bad happen how do you respond and recover in a way that that, that your organization and, and business functions are still operational yeah I, I think that that's a great way to kind of lay it out and, and maybe if you break that down george did you want to maybe weigh in on on, on kind of that uh early detection aspect of it, you know, what's, what's the value been to you? What's your experience been, et cetera? You know, I, 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 I love, you know, talking with, with Malcolm because we, we were a silence customer. Um, and, you know, I, I, I hate to, I mean, I don't like to, you know, play favorites with vendors or, or whatever, but, you know, we, we had the Microsoft endpoint product before. Um, I mean, we were seeing 20% of our endpoints every year get malware infections. Um, I mean, I mean, huge numbers, uh, you know, and it's not just the the time that it takes IT to respond. It's it's the downtime for uh, for end users. Um, I mean, th that evaporated overnight, almost, I mean, entirely. So that, you know, if we were getting a thousand endpoints a year, it, it might have been single digits, you know, the, the following years. Um, you know, and I mean, we, you know, we, we still see, you know, bad stuff coming in. Um, uh, but, you know, you know, we're, we're blocking command and control networks, you know, at our firewalls, um, you know, we're trying to escalate our game around, uh, you know, phishing, we know that's a, that's a large percentage of how the, the, the folks get in. Um, and, you know, again, you, 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 you prepare, you, you, you know, you, you have to have backups, right? So if there ever were an incident, you know, we, we want to be able to, to, to roll back. Uh, you know, of, of course, we started in our data center, you know, now we're backing up all desktop clients. So, you know, you, you've got to have, you know, kind of an understanding of the threat landscape and then, you know, back out and make sure that every part of your, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure is, is instrumented to, to both protect uh, as, as well as, you know, uh, uh, detect and, and, and mitigate. So, uh, you know, finding our blind spots, I think, has, has really been you know, kind of my, you know, call to arms, you know, what, what, what else is there out there that, that we aren't getting, that we're not seeing uh, that, you know, because once we see it, we can start to, to, to do something about it. Um, and I, I think, I think that's been a, a, a good approach for us. 
Yeah, no, I, th I think you make a good point. I, I think FireEye put out some research that said on, on an average ransomware takes about, you know, three days from initial infection to, you know, you're starting to get the notes, right? And, and uh, you know, three days is not a long time, but three days is kind of an eternity in security too, right? Uh, so so I, I guess, Malcolm, you know, you talked about kind of that lateral movement. I mean, that seems to be one of the key ways to, to, to kind of minimize the impact, right? I mean, like you said, it's not about eliminating risk entirely. W well, what have you seen there? Well, the reality is you can't eliminate risk. You can't eliminate it physically. You can't eliminate it when you invest financially. I mean, there's no risk-free anything, right? Walking across the street isn't risk-free. Right. You know, I might get hit by a bus or, you know, whatever. Um, so you can't eliminate risk. So so you always have to, to be prepared with with the highest efficacy detection and response. And like you said, three days seems short on the one hand. But on the other hand, I mean, think about it. And George, you probably have this experience. How quickly can you patch systems? I mean, I could patch 100,000 systems at Intel in 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 under a day. Right, and you think of how quiet and slow. I mean, the bad guys actually have have the software deployment mechanisms better than the commercial software deployment mechanisms, considering the sprawl they can do and how quick they can do it. Right, and invisible to the user experience, so they understand that control friction thing. So they can they can pivot quickly, and and if you don't have um, the ability to sense the lateral movement interpret what it means and then quickly take actions you're dead on arrival right you, you you will be owned in a second and and you will not be able to be on top of it but if if you have instrumented yourself well enough across the environment you can and you have a quiet enough environment because your endpoints are solid right and you've got the right advanced um you know network analysis and and tuning of that stuff you'll spot the micro movement quickly and then be able to take action on it um, before it, it becomes a significant or material event. Well, and that, that risk, risk analysis, I mean, 10 years ago, we were doing a different risk analysis, right? So with patching, you know, we, we'd, we'd do, you know, we'd spend days or weeks on regression testing with different OSs and, you know, there's a lot of variety in our higher ed environment. Um, to, today, it's, it's a different risk calculation, right? We, you know, we, we, we know the disruption that ransomware could cause. Um, and, and so I think we're more aggressive with patching uh, because, well, maybe patching has gotten better. Maybe there's, there's less of a concern. But overall, right, the, 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 the issues we're going to deal with, uh, you know, with, with interoperability, those are going to be a handful of cases. And that's, you know, I, I think today that's, what, that's easier to deal with than <laughs> losing all your data um, or exfiltrating your data or, or, or what, you know, whatever the case might be. So, um, you know, I, I think, again, that, that risk analysis is, is not going to be static. It, it, it's it's going to continue to evolve as things change. Yeah, and, you know, we've got actually a, a, a you know, kind of relevant comment coming from the from the audience right so one is um, uh, uh, George uh, people are really appreciating your uh, <laughs> your, 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 yes. your tribute uh, wall there uh, behind so so you know uh, I, I don't think that's got anything to do with the ransomware so maybe we'll move, <laughs> move on. Uh, but uh, you know the other thing I think is um, EDR that you pointed out you know, is clearly you know leaps and bounds over kind of the first generation or earlier generations of, of endpoint security right but uh, kind of two-part question, I guess. One is, um, what about the, the devices that you can't drop EDR agents on, right? I mean, we've even seen ransomware targeting, um, you know, IoT devices, operational controls, things like that, right? So that's kind of uh, part one, and then uh, we'll go to part two uh, later. But uh, Malcolm, uh, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I, I think there's two things. Again, EDR stands for endpoint detection and response, right? So, you know, it, that means if you can detect it, why couldn't you have prevented it? So th there's a little bit of the, you know, um, you need that stuff. But but getting to, to your key point, right, you, you can't put an agent on everything. And we already have too much agent sprawl that's, again, degraded uh, systems. And, and nobody wants another agent on their system, you know, in which case, um, you know, again, that, and that's for IT and performance and, and all those other things. So you have to instrument your environment, again, to, to listen, watch, and be able to be tuned for, for things. Again, you've got, uh, if in a factory environment, even if it's not IoT, factory equipment that's Windows-based or a Linux-based system that, that's connected to a network that could be ransomed, right? Or used as a pivot point. You know, you've got um, thermostats, you've got 
Heck, the building management system's a PC, for God's sakes, right? Um, the alarm system, there's all, I mean, you, you look at it and you go, I might, I might be in an enterprise with 30 or 40,000 laptops and maybe 20,000 servers, but you probably have instrumented across the environment four, five, six, 10x the amount of compute devices that could get popped and, and then be, in essence, the things that are generating um, the attack factor and the ransomware. So you have to be on the network um, you know, to be able to, to watch those things because those things are not, not really appropriate to have, have an agent on because they're not built for them. You know, and, and talking so much about instrumentation, I mean, you know, I, I, th I think there's only, there, there's only so much success that you can legitimately expect to have with a, with a kind of system to do correlation. Uh, you know, I mean, we have an MSSP and, you know, I mean, again, finding everything is a challenge. Um, you know, so you, you end up with tool sprawl and, you know, I mean, things like Microsoft ATA is, is, isn't, a, I, I mean, the, 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 it doesn't catch everything, but the things that it does catch, it, it does really well at. Um, but, you know, you're still limited to, 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 to the scope of what your tools can, can, can give you. Um, and, and, you know, so, you know, going back to, to, to Voltron for a second, um, you know, I, I think the reason that, that, that you know, I, I, I'm a fan of Voltron is, is because it's not, you know, it, it's not one person, right? It, it's a team working together. Um, so, you know, partnering with infrastructure, partnering with, you know, your app developers to, to, to do secure code, you know, you, you, you have to build in that instrumentation, you know, at, you know collectively throughout IT. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's not just one, you know, in, you know, one security instrument, you know, it's, you know, sometimes we, we, we find sysadmins that are, you know, that are just deep into looking at logs and, and they're spotting things or, Hey, I, I, I heard about this, this, you know, crazy new tool that my weird vendor has. Do you, do you want to check it out? Um, and, and I think that that's where we have success is, you know, you know, bringing people into the process to, to, to get more eyes. And as much as we want to do automation, um, you know, those things still, you know, you know, still require a lot of, you know, detailed tuning to, to understand your specific environment. Because, you know, my, mine, you know, I've, I've got weird stuff in higher ed that not everyone else on the call probably has. Um, so, you know, it, it, I think it's, it's, it's a really delicate balance. Well, I, I, I guess I was wrong when I said there's no Waltron connection to ransomware. <laughs> you know, we did find a connection. There. So, um, but, it, but it's actually a good segue into the second part of, uh, of the question from Anthony, which is, what about continuous education, right? So the users, um, the, you know, are, are clearly, you know, vectors, uh, you know, or potential vectors. Uh, George, you kind of touched on this earlier when you talked about phishing training and, and, and things like that. It, you know, clearly, I don't think it's sufficient to, to only focus on the user, but, uh, uh, you know, what are your thoughts there? And Malcolm, I know you feel very passionate about blaming the user, so I, I, I know you're going to want to weigh in as well. <laughs> I, I mean, obviously, the, the, you know, you, you don't write a whole book about, you know, security awareness, you know, <laughs> if you're not passionate about it, right? And, and you know, I, I think in security, we, we spend so much time thinking about technology. Um, you know, we, we haven't, I think, done the work yet of, of really understanding um, the, the end user and their perspective. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, it, in a limited sense, you know, you know, re well, relative to at least, you know, simulated phishing, um, you know, we, we, we kind of lament security awareness training that it doesn't work, uh, but I, I, I've found that it actually does work, right? So in terms of recognizing red flags, you know, our, our, our users are able to recognize red flags. And we know this because we've looked at time of day um, and, you know, in, in the mornings, people are 10x times less likely to click on a phishing message than in the afternoon. It, it's, it's built into our biology. Um, so, so un, you know, un, understanding and, and working with, with users to understand when they're most vulnerable and why they're most vulnerable, it, I, I think is huge. Uh, but it's also about, you know, bringing their, you know, their healthy habits into play. I, you know, I don't think we can, you know, we, we tell people to, to not click on links or we tell people to, uh, to, you know, not write their, you know, password on a post-it note, right? Um, but all of those things, you know, in, in a way are, are, are built by habit. 90% of our you know, behaviors are, are, are habit-based. And so you can't just tell someone, you know, don't, you know, do X or don't do X. You know, I mean, I'm a big fan of BJ Fogg's work with Tiny Habits and, you know, there's a recipe, right? So, you know, after I do X in, in the morning, brush my teeth or sit down at my computer or what have you, um, you know, that's the cue um, to get, 
whatever it is that we're trying to do to secure them. And, you know, a single mom might have, you know, a different set of security things that, that she's interested in than a CEO, right? And, and everything in between. Um, but then you have to, you know, whatever the behavior is, you have to kind of create a reward to, to reinforce that habit. And, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not talking about those things in, in security awareness training. We're just telling people, thou shalt, you know, you know, here's the list of things to, to go do and you, you go figure out how to, how to integrate them into your lives. And I, I, I think that's, that, that's, the, that's the help that our users need to, to get over that hop, I think. Uh, Malcolm, your thoughts on uh, you know, the user? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting, right? I think the hackers have the user experience perfectly dialed in. They know how to entice people to click on something. They make it light and easy so that uh, you don't feel it until you know the detonation occurs. Uh, and and I think and I this is where I agree with George. I'm a big believer in continuous education. In the early 2000s, it, back in my Intel days, I was probably one of the earliest ones spending millions of dollars on my employees and and trying to train them and stuff like that. And there's some thou shall thou shall not that you need to do, but but at the same time, to George's point, we don't understand the, the user experience. And, and you go, why does the user write down the password? Why do they do all these things? Well, we've made it so flippin' hard um, and the security controls get in the way that they've got to get a job done and they, they want to do it in as expeditious path as possible. And, and if we're making that harder, they're going to go around it. And so, you know, in some cases we've got to, um, design controls completely differently to help the user achieve their job while achieving security instead of the other way around, you know? And so I think if we do that, we'd, we'd be in a better spot. But again, my hot button, I'll just say it, I've said it over and over again, never ever blame a user for clicking on something and bad things occurring. That's a technology failure. Your firewall failed, your email gateway failed, your malicious code and antivirus and all that stuff failed. Your network failed. If something bad happens because a user clicked on a link or opened a message or visited a website that they believed was real, your controls failed. Blame yourself, blame your vendors and fix it rather than blame your user. Now, if your user gets you know, conned into providing, you know, their username and password on a phone, somebody's calling and saying they're the help desk and whatever, that's a user problem. If your users is in the airport and talking about a sensitive acquisition and merger or sensitive data, that's a user problem. Um, there's a bunch of things that are user problems. The rest of them are technology failures. I, I would I would actually say it slightly differently. I mean, you'll you know, say it better than me. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know about that. But you, you, I mean, I, I think with I mean, I think of my, my role or our, our roles as CISOs as, as, a, as a coach, right? And, and you know, so, you know, if, if you watch coaching interviews after games, you know, you, you don't hear uh, the coaches saying, you know, ah, I got a bunch of scrubs, you know, we, you know th this, this is a hopeless game, you know, people are the weakest link. Um, you know, I mean, you know, all our successes are, are based around, you know, the new cleats or the turf or the, you know, whatever gloves they're wearing, right? They, they don't say that, um, you know, they say, you know, we, we played a good game, you know, the other team was better that day, right? That, those are the kinds of things that you hear. We're, we're not playing the role of coach. Um, you know, again, we're, we're blaming the, the, the players and do, do, would players want to play for a team with a coach like that? Um, you know, I mean, I don't think so. Hey, George, I think you're totally right. Actually, this morning I was reading, I read the news every morning before I go to the gym and when I get back. And uh, ISC, ISC2 study that came out this morning that was in the news said um, most workers are not interested in switching to a cybersecurity role, right? You know, why is that? Well, yeah. if they're constantly getting the crap beat out of them, not only by the bad guy, but their management, why the hell would you want to play on the team to your point? Right. And, and the coaches, what do they do? They go back to the game reels. They watch and they go, hey, you pivoted right when you could have turned a little bit left. You know, you held the ball a little bit wrong and and, you know, the guy's helmet came in and popped it out or you were showboating. Knock that crap off. Right. Because that's what caused the fumble. That's where you choose somebody's you know, ass out, frankly, when when they're doing that. But it's all in the coaching. Right you know, you're, you gotta be accountable to not only 
the mission, but to the team and to the organization. And so it's a, it's a coaching to drive performance and it's a coaching to provide, uh, to provide accountability, right? Not blame. Yeah, I, I, I was commenting on uh, LinkedIn last night on simulated phishing uh, with, with some random thread uh, with a bunch of strangers. But, uh, you know, the, the, there was this comment like, well, the bad guys don't have any rules to play by. So, you know, we should send the, the hardest possible phishing emails. And, you know, re regardless of being tone deaf about, you know, what the message is or, or what the company's doing. And, you know, uh, that, that's right. You know, the, the bad guys don't have rules. Uh, but we're the good guys and the good, you know, the, the good guys do play by rules because, you know, for us, we're, we're not trying to, uh, to, 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 you know, be the bad guys. We're not trying to show how smart we are. We're trying to change security outcomes. And, you know, I, I, I'm not aware of any research studies that suggest, you know, yelling at people um, improve uh, educational learning out outcomes. You know, it, uh, everything I've read is the opposite, right? So, you know, you, I mean, I, I think we're here to motivate people and to, to get people on the team. Yeah, you know, and you, you mentioned rules. I, you know, again, yeah, we play by rules, but I, I, you know, Rudy, you've heard this from me before, risk management's a contact sport. And uh, the only rules that I play by are the ones that are legal in nature and then ethical in nature. And other than that, if I don't like the rule and I don't like the way in which the game's played, I change it. And as long as I'm not violating a law, doing something unethical, I don't care. I'll change the rule because that's, that's the, the only way to not be hamstrung right. and to compete on, on that battlefield. Yeah, you know, I, I, I thought that was actually a, a positive story a, a couple of weeks ago. I, I'm sure you read about the, the Tesla employee, right, that was uh, uh, attempted to be bribed uh, to, to deploy ransomware. And, you know, he, he, you know, he, he clearly did the right thing and, and got uh, you know, security probably involved and law enforcement involved. So I, there's definitely a place for, for, I think, for awareness and training. And I'm sure, you know, that was probably part of the training pro program that, hey, you see something, say something kind of thing. So, you know, one kind of segue from that, that, you know, we've, we've had a couple of questions come up is uh, kind of the continuous validation stuff, right? Like uh, I've heard of, uh, I've talked in talking to customers, uh, hey, we map everything to MITRE, we see where our gaps are because, you know, ransomware typically tends to take advantage of multiple stages. Um, a, well, any, any practical tips, advice uh, there uh, from either of you? For me, I, I like the whole uh, continuous validation. I, you know, obviously there's, there's the traditional penetration testing stuff people do, but again, you're throwing bodies at it. I, I like um, a lot of the stuff in the breach and attack simulation because you can run that stuff, rattle the cages in a much more effective and efficient fashion. But I, but I do think that, that we have to do a level of, of continuous validation, just like we have to do a level of continuous education. Yeah, because it, it keeps us fresh. It keeps us, you know, controls deteriorate, right? Changes get made, mistakes get made. And, and it's, it's the best way to stay kind of in shape, right? Using a training analogy um, and, and stay on your toes and be alert. You, you know, I, 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 I know um, Malcolm, you, you know, you, you've said this before, you know, I think it, I think it comes from you know, Wendy Nather. Um, you know, I mean, there, there, there's a poverty line in security. Um, so, you know, continuous awareness, I, I think, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say to a, to a small business or, or, you know, a medium, you know, business even, um, you know, that's the first thing you have to do. Um, obviously, you know, it, it would be great. Um, but, you know, I, I think there are, there are probably, a, a, you know, a lot of other things that you probably need to get to first. Um, so, you know, if, if you're, if you're strapped, um, you know, mapping to, you know, to a, a, a an industry framework, is a challenge, right? You, you've got to have dedicated people to that. And, you know, again, I go, I go back to the beginning of the conversation. If, if, if you're resource constrained, you know, focus on prevention first. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I know there are folks out there with, you know, huge teams of instant responders that, you know, are doing threat hunting constantly. And, you know, I, I mean, we're, we're higher ed. I, I, I can't possibly match that um, so, you know, and I think we've had to, to, to understand enough about our business to focus on, in, in other ways. So, so this is a, kind of a good segue as we start to move into the second part of our agenda here, right? But, but one, maybe last topic that almost straddles the two is, uh, you know, kind of preparing, right? And, and uh, Malcolm, you just touched on this and, and I'm curious, 
tabletops you know how do you engage the executives because this is not just a technical decision right uh, in terms of hey yeah i'll just restore from a backup or i'll just pay you know use my private uh, bitcoin account and pay 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 it off i mean it's it's not as simple as that i mean have have you, have you guys tried kind of simulating some of this stuff beyond just the phishing in terms of actual uh, uh, you know involving the executives and things of that nature what what are your thoughts there go, go ahead george so, uh, oh my gosh, yes. Uh, you know, if, if you're not doing tabletop exercises, you know, I mean, that is, I think, one of the best ways to get executive engagement to hear, you know, I mean, I mean for me, I'm, you know, selfishly, I, I do them to, to measure my own processes, to find, you know, gaps where, okay, well, you know, we, we went through the scenario, but, you know, really, I think, you know, all, you know, stage three of the incident response process is lacking. People didn't understand it. Um, but, you know, also at a higher level, you know, for, for your executives to be able to see, you know, where your weaknesses and strengths are, uh, you know, that, that's, that's huge. That helps you, you know, make the case for funding. You know, that, that helps you, you know, build relationships with all of those other folks. That helps you, you know, at, you know, when you do have an incident to be prepared so you've walked through those processes and people don't, you know, uh, you know, in, in, in a stressful situation, you know, we, we know that, you know, your, your cognitive functions start to, to, to narrow and shut down. Um, practicing all of that drilling beforehand, again, going back to the coaching anal uh, analogy, you know, th th those drills are incredibly valuable. Um, I, I wish uh, that, you know, I, I you know, it, it's hard to scale a tabletop. Um, so, you know, you kind of have to pick your battles, but I wish that I could do tabletops with every single employee that, that we have and, and, and run, you know, practice scenarios, you know, it, you know, at least once a year, but, you know, maybe even more often than that, as a part of our regular you know, education process. And, and Malcolm, before you chime in, you know, as, as someone who sits both on boards and kind of have, has kind of an operational role, right, uh, and advises boards, I, I'm curious how receptive have the executives, especially the non-technical executives, been, uh, you know, over the last, let's say, six months, year or two years? I think it's it's been dependent upon the the organization. I'd say most of them are receptive to it. You know, the, the board side of it, really just becomes, you know, the board's not role is, is um, governance, right? And so I, it's more of a, you're demonstrating to them that you understand it. And, and there might be in some extreme situations where the board is a validator of, of a policy or validator of the approach. But by and large, their job isn't to make decisions around this stuff. But, but getting back to, to what George said, you know, again, it's, it's a, um, if, if you're not on the field practicing your plays, how are you going to play the game, right? And so I've always taken an approach to drill in the extreme to be prepared for the ordinary. I mean, I don't care if it's logical, physical. Heck, years ago at Intel, we did a 40-hour uh, a follow-the-sun drill with solar flares going off as the sun rose that was disrupting communications, electrical grids, satellites, travel, and we had every site emergency operations center phone in. We had every business unit activate their BCPDR. And I didn't know the scenario, neither did the rest of the corporate emergency operations center. So we were getting drilled as well because we had some really sharp guys that said, full bore, all out, crazy as you can go, right? Six months later, the volcano in Iceland erupted and who would have thought that and it disrupted air travel and a bunch of other things, right? But, but because we drilled in the extreme, we found some supply chain things and some communication frailties that we tuned up that helped us for a volcano eruption, for God's sakes, right? So I, I look at it and I go, I don't care if it's physical or logical. And I would tell you that the physical side of events, again, look at COVID-19, if the, if the security team and the IT team is not engaged in those, Shame on you. Get engaged in those. Get the physical teams engaged in your logical events. Go crazy with it. And, and getting back to preparation, predefine and think about do you pay or not pay under what circumstances? You know, those should be relatively thought out so that the playbook is there. And then you're just going through the checklist so that when you're in the emotional state, you're not making a knee-jerk reaction. You're following a directional prescriptive plan that, that's adjusting in the moment rather than figuring it out on the fly. 
Yeah, it, it reminded me, Malcolm, of our conversation with Keith Gordon a couple of months ago, where he talked about a pandemic response plan that they, you know, they'd put together thinking, you know, we might execute on it, we might not. But, you know, uh, of course, now uh, we, we all know that, uh, you know, everyone had to execute on it. Um, you know, you touch on something interesting. I think, you know, as, as I've talked to a few CISOs, they view, it, view this as kind of a, a business decision, right? Hey, how, how long is it going to take me to decrypt this data, to recover from backup? Uh, you know, am I better off just paying the ransom, right? And, and I, I know both of you have said it's not as simple a decision as that, right? And, and, and maybe, maybe, you know, just, just give us some color on, on how, uh, how you've thought about that, that to pay or not to pay kind of decision. For me, you know, I, since I've always looked at risk to the business, risk to my customers, risk to society, you know, you got to put it in the context of those risk issues. And at the same time, because I'm paying in some entity out there that might be organized crime, heck, it might be some teenager who bought ransomware on the web. It could be a terrorist group. It could be another nation state. I always look at it and I have to go, if I pay am I actually uh, funding somebody who is going to kill somebody physically? Is it a terrorist? Is it a rogue nation state? So am I actually making the world a worse place because I'm trying to manage my own risk that I should have been, done a better job up front to not have it bite me in the ass so bad? And, you know, but it's again, context. If I was running a hospital and patients were gonna die, you know, I'd be more apt to, to pay the ransomware. But if it's a factory down and I'm just losing revenue, well, shame on me for not doing a good job. And I probably, if I was in the role, I would, I would be fighting tooth and nail not to pay because I'd worry about where that money would go and what harm it could create to somebody else. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would love to, you know, not be able to pay, uh, you know, I mean, it, it really, again, you have to understand the business, you have to know, you know, what, what the criticality is. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's, it's hard just to, to have a blanket statement, you know, no, I'll never pay. Um, and, you, you know, I mean, who, who knows what scenario is, is right around the corner, but I, I totally agree. You, you have to have had that conversation already. You don't want to be in the middle of it and then thinking about, okay, well, you know, let, now let's have the debate. Um, you know, we, I mean, in our last board meeting, um, you know, we, we, we brought up a, not, not our situation, but one of our vendor situations where, where you know, they, they face the same issue. Um, you know, the, the, the ransomware attackers uh, methods are changing, right? So if you don't pay, um, well, you know, now they're talking about ex exfiltration um, and potentially exposing your data. So, you know, I mean, I, I think, you know, I mean, do you trust the, uh, the, the bad guys, you know, so much that you would think that even if you pay, they're going to give you a valid key. You know that doesn't necessarily happen all the time. Um, you know, but I've I've also heard from the FBI that you know maybe they, they do have some some you know keys lying around that they could you know try out and and maybe there are other options um, than pay or not pay. Right. Um, you know. Ho you know. Hopefully you have backups. Hopefully the backups didn't get encrypted too. Uh, but, you know, I mean, again, you, you can't start early enough to, to start planning. Yeah, and I think, like you, you know, point out, I mean, you know, uh, and as we said up front, right, this is a business that the ransomware folks are running, and, and it's no longer about just can you recover from a backup, because, you know, we've seen plenty of exfiltration and data disclosures uh, happen as well. Um, there's, there's two kind of interesting pieces of news in the last uh, few weeks that I thought, you know, somehow connected to this, right? One is, that, as I'm sure you saw, the IRS basically has put out a bounty on, on Monero, right? Uh, uh, who can crack uh, the code there? And, and I have, a, uh, you know, obviously I don't have an inside, uh, inside of the IRS, but I have a weird feeling that there's something to do with, uh, with this general, uh, you know, kind of uh, alternate economy that, that's forming here. And then the other, um, you know, and Malcolm, I think you brought this up in our, in our last call, um, you know, the, the Joe Sullivan case, right? I mean, is, is that a case of, uh, you know, ransom in a sense. It wasn't traditional ransomware clearly, but, uh, I, I, you know, either of you want to weigh in on those pieces of news? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting, right? So, so you think of the physical realm, kidnapping and ransom, right? Logical realm, what's, we're seeing the equivalent of kidnapping and ransom. And then the question just becomes, what's, what's the, the, the implications? Is it, I've locked your system, so therefore I've got the availability risk. 
is that I'm going to release your data. And so therefore you have the confidentiality risk. The other one that we don't talk about that I'm sure has happened and just people have swept it under the rug is the integrity side. Because if they own your systems, how do you know that they haven't played with the data? Right. Um, and so, you know, that's another angle on it. You know, getting back to the Joe thing, you know, I, uh, I've known Joe a long time. I trust him as an individual. I, I respect him completely. It's a tough spot. I don't know all of the circumstances. I've certainly read the complaint against him. Um, but, you know, again, it, it's, 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 a, it's a tough call. But I, I think in, in those situations where you might have an external person who is maybe access the data, maybe seen it. The question is, did they, they really take it? Is, you know, what's the implications of not seeing the forensics of it? it, it you know, it's, it's, I'd say likely that he was doing the right thing for the company and the organization, but I don't know the full context um, of the stuff, but it, it does start to create an inter interesting predicament, paying bug bounties, paying ransoms, uh, you know, and stuff like that, and, and potentially the personal liability um, oh, for chief information security officers, chief security officers that are a part of that um, decision making process since, since they're the accountable party. Yeah, and in some jurisdictions, paying ransom is illegal, right? I mean, depending on how you know how you operate globally. So, well, again, uh, you might be funding a terrorist, right? right? Or funding a rogue nation state. And if you, you know, again, which gets back to how, how much due diligence do you need to do before you make the payment to make sure that you're not doing that because you might actually be creating a, a, a criminal or, or other liability issue um, with payment. And, and is the average CISO in, the, in, in that deer in the headlights moment really equipped to do that due diligence, right? I mean, I, I mean George, what are your thoughts there? You know, I, I, I would say, you know, from my perspective, I, you know, I, I've got a relatively small team um, you know, we, we, we've got certainly partners, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that help us out, but, you know, knowing the, the specific, you know, threat actors, uh, that, that, you know, are operating against us, you know, oh my gosh, I mean, that, that I think is really beyond most higher ed, uh, you know, capabilities today. So, you know, if you're a small to medium enterprise, if you're higher ed, if you're, um, you know, a nonprofit, um, man, I, I, I don't think you, you, you have the capability to, to go out there and say, yeah, this threat actor, you know, we really think that it's a, you know, it's a kid in the basement versus um, this is, you know, uh, organized crime, you know, based out of, you know, X country, um, you know, and I, I wonder, you know, I mean, you know, the, the, the IRS thing is really interesting because, you know, I mean, I, 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 I we, we didn't say this in the beginning, you know, I, I am an attorney, I, you know, I went to law school, uh, you know, 10 plus years ago. Um, but most crimes, you know, I mean, when, when, when the government can't get you on a, an actual charge, what they, they bring you up on tax evasion. Um, <laughs> <Al> Capone, and, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so when you think about, you know, uh, you know, Monero or Bitcoin or whatever, tracing those things, you know, I mean, you know, is, is that really what the IRS is interested in? Um, you know, is, is that going to be, become a new way of, of, of creating liability or exposure? Um, because they can, you know, prove, you know, financially you, you, uh, uh, you receive money, or or that you paid a bribe. Um, you know, th those those are I, I think kind of real, legitimate, long term concerns that that we'll we'll we absolutely have to figure out. Yeah. Hey, well, and getting getting back to preparation and to this question, you know, it, it's also in, it, really critical for the security organizations to be well engaged with their legal team, uh, and 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 perhaps have outside counsel expertise. Um, for some of this stuff, as well as, again, in preparation. What are your relationships with law enforcement? Do you have any? Do you know who to call? Do you know how to call? Do you know when you would engage and when you wouldn't engage? Those are all things that you could scenario play ahead of time, again, to be better prepared if, if you needed to be. And, and, and sometimes people fail to do that. And, and I'm, I'm a big believer in law enforcement, but, but I can also tell you at times from my prior experiences that Sometimes the engagement with law enforcement would have complicated things. And, and so, you know, you know, that's again, a, a, the, the, the head of security, legal, you know, and, and if you have a relationship, you can have an off the record dialogue with, with the appropriate law enforcement, you know, so that you can, again, get uh, coaching, right, on navigation of things, um, you know, without, uh, 
you know, fully go down that path if, if that's the appropriate thing to do. Well, and occasionally yeah. we'll, we'll actually invite law enforcement to participate in our tabletop exercises, right? So our FBI liaison, um, you know, SMU has a presidential library, um, you know, they're, they're, I think, you know, we've got a really good relationship with, with FBI and DHS because of that. But, you know, that, that's, that's, that's something that they will do for you, you know, even if you're not, you know, a, a, you know, a, a university with a presidential library. Um, and, you know, DHS, you know, la last year, they actually hosted a, a, a you know, our, our tabletop exercise for us. Uh, so they created, you know, we didn't bring in an outside vendor to do that, uh, that, that, you know, occasion and, and they wanted to test a blended exercise, right? So not just a cyber, you know, incident, but a, a, a cyber slash physical uh, attack against the university. So, you know, I, I think law enforcement can definitely bring, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of resources to bear uh, to, to help you. And again, you know, bringing your partner agencies in, you know, local law enforcement, as well as, you know, I mean, for us, we, we had, you know, our, uh, our care flight, you know, uh, uh, airlift company as well, right? We had, you know, other, you know, county or other agencies that we might partner with. Um, so, you know, building, again, you know, building those relationships up front, you don't have to invite them to all of your exercises. Uh, but, you know, it certainly, you know, goes a long way to, to figuring out what that collaboration with your partners, you know, can be like, um, you know, you know, when you do need right. them. Well, and you could do the same thing with people in your same industry, right? Because you're, yeah. you're not competing with your market competitors on this stuff. You know, the companies compete on products and services, right? You know, so I always have maintained good relationships with, with my peers, even in the industry, you know, in competitive quote unquote companies. Um, but, but again, you know, so you can do drills even with, with other people in other industries or in your supply chain, right? And, and that's also a way to, to, um, get lessons learned and tips and techniques or, or, or have friends that you can call on. Like I'd call you, George, as, as you know, at times, if I was like, oh crap, you know, like I do with other peers, right? Because they'll have insights and be able to give me coaching sometimes when I need it or just be a sounding board, right? Yeah, it, it, it was interesting. You know, uh, we, we, we were involved with, uh, with a, a tabletop exercise that we were helping a customer with recently. And one of the things we, we discovered that uh, they had an exposed uh, uh, system that was managed by their HVAC vendor that had remote desktop protocol exposed, right? So it's amazing. I mean, tabletops, you know, Target sometimes, you know, I think, <laughs> <laughs> you know, people think of these as kind of theoretical exercises, right? But they don't have to be. I mean, I, I, think, I think you can make them, uh, you know, as, as both of you pointed out, um, I've heard some good things of people that have worked with their local InfraGuard chapters, uh, you know, as part of that, uh, et cetera. So th there's kind of one other topic I wanted to, you know, on the whole topic of preparation that I wanted to get into in the time we have left. But uh, I don't know, one, one more quick press uh, 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 plug and, and see if, uh, if, you, if you can react to this. But there was a software company that uh, just this past week uh, disclosed a ransomware uh, attack and they were compromised, I believe in like uh, April or May, they, they, they paid the ransom and they're only disclosing it now. And um, they took an interesting strategy. They, they actually marketed the fact that they paid the ransom as look how much we care about security, we paid ransom, right? And um, I don't know, the security person in me kind of cringed at that, uh, uh, but uh, any, any quick thoughts on, on a strategy like that? Uh, stay away or it sounds like an interesting idea. Well, so I think my perspective is you have to look at the potential materiality of it, right? If they had to disclose it anyway, so you think of Sarbanes-Oxley and if it's material event and stuff like that, and, and a lot of public companies are sweeping this crap under the rug, as long as it's not a data breach, there's privacy. And as long as they can hide the material implications of the revenue hit or whatever, they're sweeping it under the rug. In some cases, if it if it uh, you know hits a threshold enough, they're forced to disclose. So that was probably uh, a situation that they probably had to disclose uh, in accordance with some regulation, and they decided to try and make lemons out of lemonade or lemonade out of lemons, right? And and try and and do it. Whether or not it's successful for them, I don't know. I don't know that I would market that I paid ransomware, um, but uh, you know that's just me. I probably also would not market that uh, we paid a ransom, uh, but but you're, you're you're right on the money, right? I mean, when you look at state data breach privacy laws, right? You know, there's always the uh, you know the get out of jail free card if you've encrypted your data, and by definition, you know, uh, the ransomware encrypts the data. So you know, uh, you know, is it going to hit that threshold? You know, well, probably not. 
um, you know, uh, you probably need to do some investigation to, to find out if, you know, if there were any large data file transfers or, or whatever before you can say that. Um, but the, you know, the, so the, the, there's, there's that fine line in, in, in cyber legal world about what's, what the definition of a breach is. And if it's only exfiltration, uh, then, you know, I mean, to, to Malcolm's earlier point, what about integrity? Um, you know, I mean, if, if uh, you know, someone were, were, to, were to break in and change all of, you know, our students' grades to, to A's, you know, well, that, that's, that's one thing. If they, choose, you know, if they choose to make them all F's, um, you know, that, that, that's, that's in a way even worse. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I, I, I've, I've thought about like, oh, well, what if, what, what if we just had, a, you know, in a way, a kind of denial of service attack where we had fake applications and we were inundated and we couldn't, you know, uh, we, we, we couldn't respond to, to all of the real students. Um, and integrity, again, you know, I, I, I think we, we need to think more, you know, more about holistic security and less about, you know, compliance check in the box. Um, you know, it meets this narrow definition, um, you know, because I don't think we get better unless we're, we're transparent and open about our challenges. Um, and, you know, again, you know, to, to, to Malcolm's point, I mean, you know, we, I, I talk a ton to, to my, my main, you know, rival down the street, TCU or, you know, or, or Baylor, right? And, and we have great relationships, even though, you know, ostensibly our universities are, are direct competitors and, you know, we, we go head to head and we have these fun, uh, you know, special games or whatever every year. Uh, but, it, you know, those are some of the, the lessons that we've learned. Uh, uh, I, I think the, the, the easy way, right? You know, so if, if someone down the street says, hey, you know, I, I, I've got this issue that really resonates with, with, with all of my stakeholders, because if, if, if TCU could get that done, oh, you know, that, that proves in a way that SMU could, could, could face that and, and vice versa. So, you know, you know, I, I, I think I mentioned blind spots, you know, trying to get rid of them in the beginning. That's, that, you know, that's learning the easy way rather than the hard way. So, you know, right. do that every time. So um, kind of last topic on this thing before we kind of wrap up, right? Uh, insurance. I mean, you know, I've heard people talk about cyber insurance as, as a strategy here. Look, I mean, insurance is one of those things, you know, do I get, you know, insurance? Do I not get insurance? What are your, uh, you know, quick thoughts there, maybe in a couple of minutes? I'm personally super conflicted about it because I, I've never talked to a, a CISO that said, oh my gosh, I'm just, I, I love my insurance, you know, package, right? I, what I hear from everybody is, you know, you know, over the last five or 10 years that I've had it, if I'd invested that money in other technologies to improve our security program, that would be a real lasting, you know, uh, uh, investment versus something that, you know, that, that's more speculative. Although, you know, I mean, I, I think there are good, you know, cyber insurance programs out there. They offer free training. Um, you know, if you have a large enough policy, they might be willing to come in and help host a tabletop exercise for you or, you know, or other things. So I, I think there's value in it. Um, but, there, you know, there are no actuarial tables today that, that say, you know, here's, you know, here's your risk of breach and that's how they're going to underwrite your, 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 your package, your fees. Um, you know, there, there, there's nothing that says, you know, I mean, I don't know, you, I, I filled out the forms every year and, you know, there, there may be two or three page long, you know, security assessments that go along with cyber. It, it's, you know, I, I don't, I, I definitely don't think it's mature enough yet to say, yeah, this, this, this is, you know, table stakes, but, you know, I, I mean, I do recognize that that is a way of managing risk and, and I, I hope it gets there. Yeah, for me, I'm, for, I'm fairly similar with that. I mean, I, I've looked at the, the cyber insurance stuff starting 12, 13, 14 years ago when it was just starting, right? And, and it's still the wild, wild west of it. And, you know, but I think at the end of the day, I, again, I haven't necessarily seen any real benefit out of it per se. I do think there are some insurance companies, though, that are, that are adding, uh, what I'd say, acumen to um, small and medium businesses, organizations that have less sophistication understanding this, that helps them up their game, right, um, and stuff. But, but at the same time, I also recognize that it's not the CISO or, or chief security officer's decision, right? It, it's it's pu purely a fiduciary. It doesn't mitigate risk. It mitigates the financial damages that you might face because of various instances. So it's a pure finance decision, usually controlled by the CFO or somebody in the treasury or somebody who manages property and casualty and all that other insurance stuff. 
Um, now, the other thing that I just, I'm, I'm a jaded person, as I think both of you know, um, be cautious of the security companies that are partnered with the insurance companies and offering that stuff because it's a profit motive on both sides um, of it. And so you might be getting sold a solution or encouraged to buy a solution from an insurance player and they're getting margin off of that to then create a coverage for you should you get popped. So don't necessarily buy into that strategy if there's a strong partnership there and, and people are, are, are doing that because there might be money being exchanged, in, in which case they might be really sub-optimizing your risk posture for their own profit max maximization. Yeah, I, I, just, just to add to that, I mean, the, you know, every, every cyber risk in, insurance policy I've read will, will have a list of, you know, uh, approved vendors, right? So, you know, you, you can only go in network to get your, uh, you know, your, your, you know, services. Um, and that, that's a challenge if you've got existing relationships. Um, that's a challenge if, you know, you just don't like those vendors or don't trust them. Or um, the tool isn't as good. Or, or, I mean, I mean, the, the, their tools might not be as good, but also, you know, you might have other vendors on retainer um, that, you know, you can get here, you know, in an hour, uh, whereas, you know, you're going to have to go back through the contract process, you know, figure out who these new vendors are. They change every year. You can't have a, a lasting relationship. So there's the, the lot, lots of challenges there. Yeah, one one thing I thought was interesting, I, I, I met uh, a CISO at, a, at an event, we, a virtual event we did recently, and he said that, you know, in a previous job, they, their insurance company actually helped them with the negotiation and handled the Bitcoin and some of that. So it's, you know, it's definitely interesting. And, I, I, you know, clearly there's no right or wrong answer. I think, you know, everyone has to figure this out for themselves. But, you know, anyways, we, it's probably time for us to start wrapping up, right? So I, I guess what, what does the future hold, uh, right, for, from, from a specific of, of kind of ransomware? I mean, we talked about integrity attacks. I mean, maybe those are already happening. Um, you know, some have suggested maybe the government needs to be more involved in, in kind of taking down some of these cartels or, or gangs, if you will, that are engaging in this. Uh, what are your, uh, you know, look into your magic eight ball and uh, maybe give us, uh, give us your thoughts on, on the future here as we wrap up. It's, it's, so just quickly for me, I think, again, there needs to be more government agent, uh, government focus on, on driving, again, the the um, hopefully deflecting people from doing this, taking them down, you know, incarcerating people, prosecuting them. At the same time, I think again, the, the sprawl of technology, every device that, that, that is IP addressable, it's connecting, it's computing, it's communicating. It has the, the, the potential to contribute or be ransomed. So you have to think about that. And then I think the, the, the notion of ransomware and just locking up your system will also start changing and it will pivot. Again, I could extract a Bitcoin toll by, by owning the home system of an executive of a large company who happens to have, let's say, photos or videos or things that might be embarrassing and blackmail them. What's the difference? Um, and why not pivot to their home systems and, and people that are in critical roles in order to extract the toll rather than ransoming the the corporate environment i mean to be honest that would be frankly easier if i was looking to do it that's probably what i'd be doing to extract a bitcoin ransom because it would be cheaper and easier than going after a company you know i i mean i i, I think that's spot on we you know we we know the you know their business models have been evolving over time and and they're going to continue to find ways of uh you know further exploiting us and you know, I mean, I, I, I would hail the, the, the person at Uber that turned down a million dollars, you know, to, to protect the company um, as, as a business strategy. I, you know, I don't think you can expect to, to do that every time. And, you know, again, I, I, I got to believe that there was a reason why that particular individual was, was targeted. Um, and, you know, they're going to, you know, continue to, you know, say, okay, well, um, did, didn't work with this person, but let's, let's move down the road. Um, you know, I mean, if you know, we know that that's happening already, um, you know, to, to, to Malcolm's point, what if they, you know, start leveraging, you know, uh, other systems, right, to, to, you know, to get further into your network, to get deeper, um, so you can't get them out. Um, you know, I mean, I, I mean, we, we know, you know, crypto jacking, you know, is, is not necessarily as sexy as ransomware, 
but you know, certainly it's making a lot of people, you know, uh, good money and it's not, you know, George, I think we might have lost you. Oh, Hopefully you didn't oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're back, George. Sorry. Yeah, Sorry, you're, you're back, George. Um, I, I think I had a, a pop-up or something come up. But but yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, we, we, we've got to keep evolving as our attackers evolve. Hey, you know, it might have been, uh, you know, your computer's way of telling us we're, we're all totally out of time here, <laughs> uh, right? So, uh, you know, what, one kind of last comment, I, you know, I, I've thought about, and I know if we've discussed this, you know, ransomware could just be a distraction, right? I mean, there might be a bigger motive here that, uh, you know, I, I find that the deer in the headlights thing when ransomware hits seems to be a lot worse than any other attack I've seen and help customers respond to. Uh, in, in my past life. And, and you know, I, I know ransomware can be really tragic and can be really bad, but, but let's not forget that we've got a broader infrastructure uh, to protect and you know, a much bigger attack surface that we're dealing with. So folks, thanks again for joining us. Uh, you know, Malcolm and George, you, you know, incredible insights as, 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 as always. Um, you, know, uh, I, uh, you know, we'll keep the conversation going. Uh, you know, Malcolm and George are very active on social. You know, uh, Awake is very active on social. So follow us there. Uh, and if you want to get a recording of this webinar or want to share this with anyone else, you know, you can go to awakesecurity.com slash webinars. And we hope you join us on, uh, you know, one of our future webinars as well. Uh, again, thank you, everyone. Thanks, George. Thanks, uh, Malcolm. And uh, everyone have a great rest of the day. Thanks. Thank you, guys.